Okay. So we'll get started. So we will uh, jump in here. Good, we got good number, that's excellent. All right, let me just start. Um, so first off, let me share my screen and then uh, you can feel free to ask questions while we're doing this. So the first thing we'll do, we'll look at the uh, syllabus. Oops. So, so today we're going to continue to talk about assembly language programming, and uh, and then on Friday we'll do Lab Two. Now, don't worry if you haven't gotten Lab One done. Uh, there's plenty of time to do both. All the uh, most of the program will be the same as what you did for Lab One, but uh, we're going to add a couple of things, and we'll talk about that. One one thing we'll add is instead of using a counting loop uh, to do our delay. We'll use uh, one of the one of the modules on the chip. Oh, and I want to start recording. Let's see. Let me make sure. You're recording. Oh, good. It's recording. Excellent. Okay. Great. Okay. Good. I had sent some of them up to automatically record, and I had set and then some of them not to. So, all right. And then. Uh, yeah, do this. Okay. Well, yeah. That, Maybe we'll do this. Okay, that's not good. There we go. Oh, my God. Okay, so, um, so we'll, we'll do the timing loop with one of the built in peripheral modules. Now, this is what really makes microprocessors. Um, exciting is that they have all these built-in capabilities. It's not just a little computer that you can write a program to and it runs instructions. It is a, it, it is a computer with a whole host of built-in modules that perform all sorts of great functions. Some of the modules, can you shut the door, babe? Is that mine? Yeah. Well, you can give it to me, whatever. Anyway, it's... Um, it, it has all these built-in modules. Some of the modules are purely digital modules like counters or timers. Uh, some modules can count external pulses coming in. Uh, then there are analog monitors like uh, a, a touch sense module that lets you use touch buttons, a, uh, an analog to digital converter that lets you feed in an analog signal and change it into a digital value, a comparator let, that lets you compare two analog signals and <clears throat> have different things happen when one signal is higher than the other or the other is higher than the first or they're the same or whatever. Uh, and, and then PWM outputs where you can control servos, uh, where you can dim lights, uh, where you can do all sorts of fancy things. Uh, and then all sorts of digital uh, communication modules, uh, I squared C, SPI, UART, uh, and on a number of chips, other ones, ones that are used in automotive buses, uh, not, not a bus that you take students in, but a bus that uh, connects different, uh, different uh, electronic modules. Um, so, and, and it just goes on, not to mention peripheral ports. Peripheral ports just in and of themselves are incredibly powerful. And each peripheral pin, generally most of them have Either, either a digit can be either used for digital purposes or analog purposes. A few of them uh, are only digital, but most of them uh, have analog functions as well. In addition to all that, it also can run debug software that lets you uh, inspect different uh, uh, registers on the chip as you try and run your program like we did on last Thursday. So it's really, really powerful. Uh, these, ch these chips have so many uh, incredible features, and they only cost about a dollar. And if you think about it, uh, you could never go out and buy all these components for a dollar. Uh, and in fact, uh, you can get chips from China that are uh, that are uh, that that are uh, even cheaper. You can get microprocessors with a number of per peripheral modules on them for just a few cents. It is amazing. So with all this power. Uh, there would never be a reason to ever buy discrete components, uh, AND gates, OR gates, flip flops, and 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 use discrete components to set up something. It's always cheaper 
and easier and much more powerful to do it with a microprocessor because not only can you implement simple logic, but uh, you can also add in all sorts of intelligence if you want other features and all sorts of stuff. All right, so anyway, so we're gonna continue to work on this. Today, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try and get through, um, so let me shrink this down and let's do this. All right, so we're gonna we're gonna uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the assembler directives again, which you've used. So now that you've got the first program, hopefully under your belt, uh, well now we can really dig into some of the details, so you really understand how to use these instructions and 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 not just the the handful we've been using, but any of the instructions in the instruction set. All right, so assembler directives we've used a couple. Bank cell was one, org was another one. Uh, C block and NC block was another one. We uh, end was another one. Um, so we've used a different. These are not instructions. These are assembler directives. Some of them result in instructions. Some of them don't. Um, the bank cell does result in, in an instruction. It creates an ML uh, an uh, an MOV L uh, MOV LB instruction uh, to get the bank select register set to the right bank. But but many of them don't. Uh, many of them don't create uh, instructions, they do different things. And they're basically used to tell the assembler to do something. And a lot of them are set up for conditional assembly, so you can write these powerful modules and, and then depending on what processor you're using and this and that, it, it'll add different parts. Um, <clears throat> for simple programs, you only need a handful of assembler directives. Um, and for the most part, if you just learn a handful, you, you'll, you'll be all set to do whatever you want with your chip. Okay, so here are some key ones, and I'm, and then I'll just go through a bunch that you might also want to use. Well, a bunch of others, just so you can see how many there actually are. But we're not going to talk about them. We'll just kind of scroll through the slides. So you've used the bank cell. Upper lowercase is fine. Underscore underscore config. That's 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 what uh, that's what sets these uh, processor configuration bits. This is auto generated by uh, MP Lab X for you, so you. You don't have to remember this, but it is a double underscore. Uh, equate, uh, we're gonna show you how to use equates in a second. You can use these instead of the uh, C block stuff. And then there's a pound include, which you've also used to put in your, uh, any header files or to put in the, the files that you might, that might use for uh, um, including your, your pick 16F1829.inc uh, file. Uh, and then we use the list directing uh, to just add listing options, particularly use, uh, we've also used the radix command uh, along with the list command to specify the default radix. And you can abbreviate that R equals. And then we've used the R uh, macro. This macro definition is, uh, is really interesting. You can define a series of steps and then, and then, uh, and then you can reference them just with a single line. Uh, and that's called macro. Back in the days um, when we still wrote a lot of programs in assembly for desktops and laptops, uh, we, it was called macro assembler uh, because it allowed you to use a bunch of macros. Okay, here's some other ones. And I'm not gonna go through them all. Um, there's a B-A-N-K-I-S-E-L for generate indirect bank selecting code. And that, you know, we're not going to use that, but it's there. Uh, and then C block, you can do code, uh, which gives you uh, where you want to create chunks of object files, which you can link into, into bigger programs. We're not going to get that complicated. Um, then uh, there's a keyword constant, which declares a symbol of constant. Uh, and then we can store, there's a DA for uh, data store and strings. There's a data command, a DB, a DE, a pound to find, um, and a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, and there's a whole bunch more, and a whole bunch more. So there are quite a few assembler directives. Again, we're not going to get into all these. All right. Assembly instruction syntax. So all instructions in assembly language for the for this chip have uh, have a, a possible up to, uh, well, they have four areas, okay? A label, 
Usually we put the label on the line above, so we don't even necessarily put in the same line, but you can. And then we have an opcode field. We have an operand field. You can have up to two operands, um, but most, instru most instructions, many instructions do take two. Some instructions only take one, some take none. And then a semicolon and any comment you wanna make all on one line. Once you get to the next line, you're starting over with a label. So if you run your comment over, the, the, the letters on the next line will be interpreted as a label. So just keep your comments uh, to one line or to the remainder of the one line. And uh, the, I, the ID will format this for you if you uh, let it. Okay, so here's some, um, so we're gonna go through, I'm gonna go through um, the basic instructions here in a second and we'll use exactly the syntax. I probably should have moved that slide down. But anyway, remember our program, we already declared, we used the C block. We started it, I think I started at 20, not 30 here. Uh, I'll fix that. But you, because the first legal space is hex 20. So that's why we did that. Uh, okay, well anyway, and then we defined variable A and variable B and then we had N C block. You can do this, this is fine. So it signs variable A to location 20 hex and variable B to location 21 hex. But you could also do, uh, you could put variable A here, EQU uh, 0x20 and variable B EQU 0x21, or you could assign them wherever you want. You, of course, you're, you can't assign them to, um, well, you can assign them to core registers, but it, it's gonna mess things up. And then you have these, uh, then you have, uh, so, so this is another assembler directory that we haven't used yet called EQU or equate. And I usually do my variables either with a C block if I'm gonna do a bunch of them or with EQUs. Uh, but there are a whole bunch of other assembler directories you can use. Remember though, unlike C, these are not typed. These are just, it just uses, instead of writing zero X 20, we're using the letters capital V, lowercase ar, capital A, uh, is substituted in hex 20. Wherever, wherever variable A appears, the assembler substitutes in 0x20 when it, when it assembles the code. Same with the equate. Okay, so here was the, here was the code, uh, here, at least some of the code, we, this is similar to the code we used. This, is, this was our setup stuff here, where we, we did this bank cell, and, uh, and we, then we loaded six alpha, uh, or maybe we did six, uh, maybe we used six C, I can't remember. I guess we did six alpha. Put that in the OSCON register. And then we cleared Tris A and we cleared port A or maybe latch A. And then we did our blink loop where we bank sell lat A. We set bit five and then we called delay. We bank sell lat A again. And that's because in our delay routine, we use bank cells. So we changed the contents of the, of the um, BSR. So the bank select register. So we have to, uh, we have to reset that contents to point to the right bank that the latch is in. And then we bit clear. When we set the bit, we actually turn the LED off. When we clear the bit, we actually turn it on, call the delay and do go back to the top of our loop and just do this over and over again until we, uh, until we turn it off. Um, so this is like an infinite while loop and, um, or an infinite for loop. And, uh, and we do, uh, Notice that we have to have a delay after we turn it off and we have to have a delay after we turn it on. If we took out this delay, then it would appear to always be on. If we took out this delay and left this delay in, it would appear to be always off. You might see just a little teeny flash, but maybe not, it's pretty fast. You might see just the dimmest of lights. Uh, so you do have to be, you do have to have two delays to make it work. And if you wanted more delay, you could just call delay twice, or you could write a new delay routine to, to basically run it through it twice before it returns. Okay, now here's our delay routine. And I, so just wanna go through, so look at the commands we use. And we've used the command MOVLW, MOVWF, we used clear F, and then we also used bit set F, we use the call command, we use bit clear F, the call command and the go to command. 
We're going to add a, a, a couple more here. We, this is our delay routine. And we basically counted uh, our inside counts to 256. And we do that using the outside routine 256 times. So our effective count is 256 times 256 or eight bit or a 16 bit counter, which basically makes us go to 60, 64K. And notice here we have uh, MOVLW. So we put a constant in W and we store it in variable A. And then we decrement F skip on zero variable A. Now, one of the things that's missing in this decrement F skip on zero instruction is our second operand. We're using, we didn't put the second operand here, but it works because by default, it, it always uses uh, the default value of F. And there are only two possible values, W for the W register and F for the file register, which is really just a single bit and it's zero or one. All right, we did use a return command here from our subroutine. We used the go to a couple of times. We had you know four labels here, uh, delay outside, go on and inside. And, um, and, but the new instruction here was this decrement F skip on zero instruction. So when the variable A gets decremented to zero, it skips the next instruction and that's why it returns. And here, when it decrements to zero, that means we've counted the inside loop 255 times. So we are 256 times. So now we count the outside loop one time and then another 256, another one, 256, another one. And finally, we have counted the outside loop 256 times as well. And we go to the return. Okay, so I'm not gonna get into these reset and interrupts until uh, we do that lab. That'll be the lab, at, that'll be the lab for, the, for next week, not this week. This week, we're gonna use a timer. And I do wanna, uh, let's see, I'm not gonna go through this or this, and that's the same thing. Okay, here's the timer routine. On Thursday, I'm gonna go through this in great detail so you totally understand how to set this up. Um, and uh, so I think I'm going to, OK. So I want to go through the basic, some of the basic instructions. I want to talk about an instruction we haven't used yet, which is called the move F instruction. And then I want to talk about the uh, MOVWF instruction, which we have used, and the MOVLW instruction, which we've also used. All right. So I'm going to go through these in great detail. Uh, so. What I'm going to do then, I'm going to, I'm going to switch to my uh, little, let's see, let me do this real quick. We'll bring this up. And then. Okay, now I, I want to go through these in detail because these are super important. And let's see, we have to do this. And that up here. Okay. okay. All right. And then I'm going to move this over. Oops, didn't mean to do that. Okay, now we go. Okay. All right. And hopefully this is, this is, uh, there we go. Okay. Now, um, so, so the, so first I'm going to talk, so let, I want to, I want to, I want to first go back and look at um, the, the, uh, the, uh, the Adobe here, and I want to pull up. Yeah. So if we if we look at the instruction set, which is again chapter twenty nine, and we scroll down, well, there's a couple of things. First off, we have these little codes that are going to be used in our, our table to describe things. We have a little letter F, and that stands for the register file address. And that's, that's all of our random access memory locations and our special function registers. We have W, which stands for the working register. We have this B, which is a bit address within an 8-bit file register. And that's, that's when you use uh, bit set F and bit clear F uh, for the latch. 
and you put a number after the LATA, comma five or comma two, or or if you do in C, you did LA, LATC, comma uh, six for the uh, for the red LED. Then we have this K. That's the literal field. That's that's what we use when we loaded up um, uh, six alpha or yeah uh, our uh, yeah six alpha when we uh, wrote that to the oscillator control register. Uh, and then we have this little D bit here. And this D is a single bit. It's either zero or one. If it's zero, it stands for the W register. And if it's one, it stands for the file register. But it's a single bit. And this, is, this makes up the second operand. And then uh, that's all we're gonna worry about. We're not gonna talk about the indirect addressing or pre, pre and post increment with uh, indirect addressing. All right, and here are, the, here are all the different types of instructions that exist. So there's, there are instructions that have an opcode, a D bit, and seven bits of file address. Remember, this is, this is your typical byte oriented instruction where we have, a, we have a, a file register, a 12 bit address, the lower seven bits are in the instruction itself here, and the upper five have to be properly set up in the BSR before we execute this. Then we have a bit oriented where we have an opcode, we have a three bit uh, B, which designates which bit, in our case, we use bits five and, and that are two maybe, or even bit six. And then we have that lower seven. We have that lower seven bits of address of the file register, and that's the that's the uh, bit set f, bit clear f instructions, and uh, and then we have a literal instruction. And this is when we moved uh, six alpha into the W register before we loaded it into the oscillator control. We have an opcode and then seven bits of uh, of constant that's gonna be loaded into the W register in, in, in the case we use. Is, this is similar to the format for the, the, uh, the MOV uh, LB instruction for the BSR and it's down here. It's the only instruction for this type and it has an op code that takes up from bits five to 13 and then the lower five bits are the literal that go into BSR. Only five bits because that's all of the implemented bits in the BSR. And this is this is instruction for loading the um, the program counter latch high seven bits, uh, but for our MOVLW, it has eight bits right here MOVLW. All right, and then we have a few others. We have some where we have just an opcode, uh, and then we have some used with our file select registers for indirect addressing. And then here's the branch always instruction. And then here's the go to instruction. So that's all the different formats. You'll notice the difference between the go to, it has an opcode from 11 to 13, and it has 11 bits of two's complement offset. Whereas the branch always instruction uh, has only nine bits of two's complement offset. So, so the, the advantage of the go to is it has more bits in its two's complement offset, it has 11 instead of nine, two more bits. All right, then here are the instructions. So we'll talk about these byte-oriented instructions first, and, and that's what I wanna go through. Now notice, if you look at how these instructions are set up, notice how we have, we have, we have the, the letters here, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, D, F, 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 F. Okay, so what does all that mean? This, if you go back to what we looked at at the beginning here, uh, just a second ago, up here, these letters are, are what's in that key. Remember the F is the seven bit address, uh, uh, the lower seven bits of the file register address. The B is, uh, sorry, the D is that single bit, which is either a zero or a one. Zero standing for store the result in W and one standing for store the result in F. So now knowing that and looking at this instruction again, what we basically see is the, uh, the add W to F, F comma D. So our F specifies the location we're gonna add to W and the D bit specifies whether the sum gets stored in W or gets stored back in the file register overriding the original value in F. And if you write it into W, of course it overwrites the original contents of W. 
Now notice this one can set the carry bit, the digit carry, and the zero bit. The next instruction here, we have add W to F and carry. So this actually adds in the carry bit as in the, for the low order uh, addition. So you're adding W plus F plus the one carry bit, which is considered a low order bit. So it, it adds up in the, in the ones column. Let me show you what I mean by that. So, so let's, say, let's say we have a zero, 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 um, zero, one. So four bits, four bits. Or you can write that as zero X, zero, one. In the, let's say we have that in, in, red, in, in variable A. And in variable B, we have zero X, zero, two. And then in the carry bit, it's, it happens to be equal to one. So what would, what would we have as a result? So if we add this, if we add, if we, if we loaded A into W, so now the W has zero X, zero one. We do that by first moving A to W and then we execute this carry instruction and we'll have to bank cell for A and bank cell for B unless they're in the same bank. We don't have to bank cell for carry because it's, it's always in the status register. And then we execute the instruction. Um, so we execute the instruction. ADDWF, okay. So ADDWF. And now since A is in W, we're going to reference B. And now, so let's see what the result would be. So we're going to, we're going to add one plus two plus one for the carry. That's going to give us, uh, that's going to give us zero X04, or that's going to be zero, 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 one, zero, zero. And we could preface that zero B. So then that would be the correct notation for it. But this is the actual value. Where do, you, where do you want that stored? Do you want to leave it in W or do you want to put it in, in B? Can you put it in A? No, you only have the choice of W or B with this instruction. You don't have the choice of A. You, you put A into W, but you can't, if you want to put this result in A, first you'd have to put it in W and then you can write it to A. So let's say we want to leave it in W. So then we would do comma zero, or you can do comma, uh, comma W, uppercase or lowercase. It's easier to do W in case you forget that, um, that W means zero and F means one. So I usually use W or F, and that, that makes it easier to remember. Let's say, so here's how our instruction would, would look. We'd, we'd, we'd bank cell, bank cell A, we'd move F, A, comma, W. Now, I have to have the second operand here as well. Almost all of the instructions that are byte-oriented instructions have this this d bit see the d bit here d bit d bit d bit here it's here it, it, there's no d bit and that's because this is clear f so there's no you can't clear f and leave the result in w that doesn't work you you have to clear if you're going to clear f you obviously want all the zeros to be put in f not anywhere else and and then so there's so if you see the d here Almost all the instructions have this D bit, except for clear F, clear W. Clear W doesn't even have a second operand. Clear W just has uh, just has an opcode, and and it wastes two bits here at the end, which is interesting. Then you have uh, all the rest of these except for M O V W F, and it also does not have a second operand. So what does that instruction do? You've used this instruction. That's when you stored. The, uh, the constant into the oscillator control register 
to set it for four megahertz. So you would load it up six alpha into W and then you did MOVWF after you bank celled for OSCON and you put that six alpha into OSCON. And we saw that happen as we uh, looked at the registers using the debugger. So you know, uh, if you're writing W to F, there's no need for that second operand to tell you whether to leave the result in W or F. You're obviously intending to put the result in F. So there's no need for that second operand. So we have a D bit, except in the cases where, where there's no, no point in having a second operand, when you're clearing and when you're moving W to F. But everywhere else, you get to choose where to leave the result. When you add, when you add without carry, when you add with carry, when you and W with F, you can leave the result in W or F. But remember, wherever you leave the result, you wind up destroying the information that was there previously. So like, for instance, let's take anding W with F. What if we use the same, the, we we'll use the exact same uh, things we had before. Let's say A is one and B is W. We put A into W and now we're gonna, now we're gonna, now we're gonna and W with F. So we're gonna take, we're effectively gonna take uh, 0x01, zero zero and we're going to and it with 0x02. Um, zero zero so that's the same as 0000001, zero 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 and we're going to and that with 0000010. Zero 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 zero. And what are we going to get when we and those? We're going to get all zeros because the one, it's going to be a bitwise and. One's going to bitwise and with this zero, that'll be a zero. One will bitwise and with that zero, that'll be a zero. And all the others are going to be zeros because they're zero ending with zero. And you get a big fat zero. Where are you going to put that result? So, and F, so we would put and W to A and D W F, B, comma, uh, comma. Let's say we want to put it back in B, we would put it, we would put an F here uppercase, lowercase, or you can put a one constant if you want. If you wanted to leave a W, you put a W. Remember, can you put it in A? No, you, you, if you wanted to put it in A, instead of an F here, you'd, you'd leave it in W. And then, and then the next thing you do, and you also have to remember, we might have to bank cell B here if B is in a different bank. But if it's in the same bank as A, then you can skip that. If it's in a different bank, then we'd have to bank cell A again, and then we could do M O V W to F A. And now we'd put the result, we'd leave the result in W and then we'd write it out to A. Do we need a second operand here? No, this is the, one of the three byte oriented instructions that don't take the D bit. They don't take that second operand because obviously you're taking W and moving it to F and you don't wanna specify where to leave the result because obviously you're leaving the result in A. Just like when you clear F, you're clearing F, you're not gonna you know, turn the contents of F into zeros, but store the result in W. And when you're clearing W, there's no operands because obviously you're clearing the W register. All right, so, so, it's, so it's, good, it's good to do that. Now, let's, what I wanna do now, I'm gonna, uh, so let's see, I think I've covered, let, let me shrink this down for a minute, oops. Okay, so I, I've talked about, so I've, I've sort of covered all the things I wanted. Um, remember we used the decrement F and skip on zero instruction in our, in, our, um, in our delay routine. And notice also that there is an increment F skip on zero, but we don't use that very often because uh, it's kind of hard to, you, you, you have to put in essentially a two's complement number and then you increment it and, and a two's complement negative number, and then you increment it. It's just a whole lot easier to do the decrement F skip on zero. Now, what I wanna do, and then we use the bit clear F and bit set F instructions. What we haven't used these bit test F skip clear, bit test F skip set, but, but uh, I, I'll talk about those briefly right now. And, and then we have on the literals, the only literal we, the, the literals allow you to do um, it, it allows you to take the contents of W and either put a put a constant into W or take take 
the contents of W and add it to a, to a constant, and it with a constant, or it with a constant. Um, and then there's the one for the, the BSR and the, and the, the, uh, the PCL latch high. Then you can also move it to the, move the constant W. You can subtract the constant from W or you can exclusive or with W. So the, it gives you this functionality with a constant and W. So all these things do constant and W with the exception of the MOVLB and the MOVLP. Those are kind of two outliers. They do the, 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 the PCL, the program counter latch high or the, the BSR, the bank select register. But all the rest of them deal with W. And the constant in all cases is eight bits, except for the, the MOVLB, it's five bits. MOVLP, it's seven bits. Because remember the upper seven bits, the banks, the program counter is only 15 bits. The, 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 uh, uh, the, uh, the lower eight bits are, are in the PCL and the upper seven bits have to be preloaded into the, uh, into the, uh, uh, the program counter latch high. And then when you write the program counter low, it's written in at the same time to do a 15 bit write. Again, we're not gonna use that because instead we're gonna use branch always or go to. And as long as you're not branching very far, you can use either one. If your branch, if you need all, uh, ele all, uh, all 11 bits of the two's complement value, then, then, you need to, uh, then you need to use the go to. If you only need nine bits, uh, then you can use the BRA. So it's probably just good practice to just never use the BRA. There's no speed or program size advantage to using it. There, so there's, it's really, I don't even know why they have it because it, it I guess it's a legacy instructions why they have it. But, but I would always use the go to because uh, it, 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 it has a bigger address range. You could theoretically exceed the range of your go to, and now you have to think about that. Uh, but, it, it, we're not going to have programs big enough to do that. It's certainly not an assembly. And C, you don't have to worry about it because C takes care of all the branching for you. So it's not a problem. And then we have a few other instructions. The call that we use to get to our subroutine, and it has the same, uh, if you look, the subroutine call actually has uh, exactly the same number of bits. It has 11 bits, just like the go to. And then we have the return instruction. Which returns from the subroutine, or you can do with you can do uh, return with a literal and W from your subroutine. But uh, remember, you can't return a value per se because uh, this just is a constant. So you can put you this constant is in the instruction. So it's not like you get to specify the results of some calculation and return that in W. It doesn't work that way. It, it's a constant. So you could like indicate, uh, you could have one uh, return with a constant in W that was zero, which means there was an error, or, and you can have one return with a constant in W of a one, which means it was uh, it executed correctly. And then this is the return from interrupt enable, uh, and and uh, there is no, it's just an opcode. There's no constant there, and you know what? Uh, that K is an error. And it shouldn't be there. So just to show you that uh, that data sheets, one that's been out for many, many, well, for four or five years, still has errors in it. And this is an error. There's no K because look, no K is over here. So it's a it's an opcode only instruction. And that's because you can't return a value from an from a interrupt routine. So uh, it's crazy. Yeah, I never noticed that before. There are other errors in this one, by the way. Uh, so you always have to be careful. Not only are data sheets difficult to understand and to, and to make sense out of, but, uh, but, you, uh, but you'll find errors in them that can be very upsetting. Okay, so now what I'm gonna do, I, I, wanna, I wanna do a few small routines using a, a small group of instructions, basically the instructions we just talked about. So uh, the move F, MOVWF and MOVLF, LW. Uh, but before I do that, I promised I would say something about the, these two here. 
bit test f skip clear, bit test f skip set. Now, these are very, very similar to your bit clear and your bit set instructions. The only difference is they don't change the bit, they test the bit. And you specify the bit just like you do up here. So the instructions look very similar. If this, this bit test f skip clear, so, it, so you do the same thing. You specify, like you could test, say, uh, you could test uh, port five. Now remember, now you're looking for an input value. So we're gonna actually use, um, we're gonna use our push button as a push button input in the lab this week. And I'll talk about that more on Thursday, but we're gonna use this bit test F skip clear and bit test F skip set instruction. And if the push button is pushed, then you wanna use the right instruction. And what you do is you skip then the next instruction and it allows you to branch or not branch or depending, just like with the decrement F skip on zero. There are no, the, there, there are no conditional uh, uh, branching instructions. All we have are these four skip instructions. That's it. And then you have branch always and go to. Some, uh, some microprocessors do have conditional branch instructions, but we don't have it in this one. So you have to, you have to test, like for instance, if you want to branch on, a, a, well, you can, you can test condition bits like branch on carry, you could test the carry bit and you could branch bit test F skip clear on the carry bit or bit test F skip set on the carry bit and then put your, or you'd branch if in fact it was clear or set. Okay, so let me go through now. Uh, I, wanna, I wanna do, uh, I wanna cover some specific examples using these instructions. And here they are. First thing I'm gonna do I'm going to talk about how we do a for loop. So a for loop in assembly. Now, how do you set that up? Well, it it's a little harder than it is in C. In C, it's really easy, right? Let's somewhere in C or in C plus plus, you don't even have to do this. You can just define it in the for statement. But in C, you have to first you have to do say uh, integer uh, k, and then somewhere later on, you do a for loop for k equals zero, k less than some count. We'll say a hundred. Uh, K plus plus. And then you put in curly brackets all the instructions you're going to execute 100 times. Once you've done this loop 100 times, you drop out and you go to the next instruction down here. In assembly language, you do exactly the same thing, but we have to, we have to, we have to do one thing first. First, we have to, uh, we have to set up our index. Now, let's use the equate statement. So we'll, in this case, up in the top, before we get to start our code, we'll have k equ, uh, say we'll put it in location. Um, let's, let's put it in the upper, in those upper uh, seven, zero to seven F where it's mapped to every bank, so-called common RAM. So we'll do zero x uh, seven zero. That'll put it in common RAM. Now it doesn't matter what, what the BSR is set to, we'll always be able to get to this location. And we'll call that K. And it's eight bits. All right. Remember the integer in C uh, could be 16, could be 32 in, in the PIC assembler, in the, in the XC8 assembler, it's 16 bits. All right. But in your, in your IBM assembler, it's probably 32. All right, and there might even be examples where it's 24. C doesn't define how many bits it is. It's compiler dependent. <clears throat> All right, now, so we, now we've defined K. All we've done is whenever we write K, it's gonna write zero X 70 instead. So we could have even skipped this, but, but it's good programming practice to use mnemonics so you know this K is your index. Okay, now somewhere before, Let's say you're getting, you're doing a bunch of code, and then finally you, you're ready to do a for loop, and you want to do some code, uh, say ten times, or let's say, uh, let's say you want to do it, um, let's say you want to do it seven times. Okay, 
So then, you, then what you would do is you bank, well, in this case, we don't have to bank sell, but I'm gonna do it anyway. We bank sell K, but since it's in the common RAM, we don't have to, because we put it in 70, right? But we'll bank sell K just to remind you to do it, but it's actually not necessary in this particular example. So, so we won't bank sell K. But what we'll do then is we're going to load K up with a constant. So we're going to M O V literal to W. And we're going to do it seven times. So we'll do zero X, zero, seven in hex. But that's the same thing as seven in decimal. All right. <laughs> Go ahead, question. OK, then we'll do M O V. W to F K. Now notice this does not require the second operand. <coughs> and these little instructions never take a second operand either. Okay, now, now that's done. Now we're ready to do our for loop. So we're gonna do loop here. And then what we're gonna do in our for loop, we're gonna have, uh, we're gonna do instruction, you know, we'll do instruction one, two, three, four, whatever. And then finally, we'll, if we had K as in a, in a standard RAM location, we would bank sell. But in this case, we don't have to because we put it in common RAM. We put it up here in location 70, which is in common RAM, mapped to every bank. So we're okay there. And then what we would do is we would do our decrement F skip on zero instruction, K. And we should put it to second operand which is F, but by default, we know that if you don't put, if you don't put F, it is, it is by default. And how do we know that? Well, we have to look at the data sheet and we go up here in the, where we defined it. This is where you would find that information. And right here, uh, where it says the D bit, default is D equals one. So if you don't specify, then, then you're writing D equals one. So if you wanted to put it in W, good luck. It's not going there. It's going in the file register and it's going to destroy whatever information might have been in that file register. So you have to, you have to, you always have to remember the default is one if you don't specify that D bit. Okay. Now, but I'm going to put it, I'm going to put F there because we do want to store the result in F. We don't want to leave it in W because in F, so when we start it off, F equals zero x zero seven but after this instruction now f equals zero or sorry i shouldn't say f but k equals k equals zero x zero six now we do a branch always bra to uh to loop or you could do a go to loop and then our instructions for the rest of the program continue down here we would go on with whatever code we were going to write there uh and that would be the after the for loop. That would be done with the for loop. Because what's going to happen now, the first time we go through, we've loaded seven into K. So it's all set with seven. We enter the loop. We go through all these instructions here. Then we decrement F, skip on zero K, comma F. So we decrement the seven to a six, stored it back in F. Now, now K equals six. Okay. Then we branch to loop. We don't skip because K is not zero. We go up here, we do arrow this again, and now K equals five. We do it again, it equals four, three, two, one. And finally, the last time when it comes through is one, we decrement it and now it is zero. So we skip this branch instruction, which means we drop out of the loop and continue executing instructions down here. All right, so that's the for loop and assembly. So let me stop there and see if anybody has any questions about that. Um, sir, yeah. why did we do um, the equals K at the beginning with 0x70 if we changed it to 0 7 Okay, so what you're doing is you're mixing up two important parts. Every variable that we use a, a name for, in this case K, has two aspects. One is it has an address where it lives in memory, and the other aspect is that it has a value stored in memory at its address. Whatever that address is, it, there's, an, there's eight 
bits waiting to be set to whatever value k is, is taking on. So the address of k we set up to be the address of k we set up with the equate instruction here to be hex 70. But I, I guess it was a little confusing, but the value I stored in k here, I put seven into the w and I stored the w into k. So now k equals seven decimal or seven hex, they're the same. Not 70, 70 hex is a lot bigger than seven decimal. So 70 hex is its address and seven decimal is its value stored at 0x70. So we've stored the value at, at, at address 70 and the value in this particular case happens to be seven. I should have made it eight or five or something different, but that's what we did. So the, the, does that answer the question? Uh, was that Ben or who was that? Oh, that was me. And yes, oh, that answers it. Thank you. Oh, okay. Yeah. So it's a good question though, because one of the most common mistakes that gets students into trouble is mixing up the value and the address. Remember, the address is where it lives in memory, and the address can be up to 12 bits, including seven in the, embedded in the instruction and five in the BSR. But the value can only be eight bits because you have an eight-bit data bus, and every location in memory is eight bits. So in our for loop here, uh, in our for loop, uh, what's the maximum number of times we can execute our for loop? Seven. What's that? Uh, isn't it the seven? Since we yeah. said it's only seven. So if we it's if we put seven in it, but we could put we could put two hundred and fifty five, right? Or or zero x f f. Except if we did that the first time through. Uh, yeah, yeah, we could put, we could even put zero, zero. And the first time through it would decrement it to FF. So we can actually, so we can actually do it 256 times, but that's maximum. We can't go any more than maximum. And that's if we start with, with a, a value of zero and 70 in, in K, which is stored at location 70. Okay, so, so uh -huh. go ahead. Question? Uh, well, you're talking about the when you said K E K uh, E K or E Q U for the seventy uh, address for the hex. Um, where can we find? I believe you covered this already, but where can we find the other addresses or how many addresses that we can set? Um, okay. Yeah. Great. Good question. Okay. So let's let's do that. So we just go to the data sheet and we go up here to. Uh, memory organization, and we go down to our program, our, our data memory, not our program memory, but our data memory. Oh, and here, here it is. We have we have seven banks. You're not with, screen. Oh, sorry. We have seven banks, each with eighty bytes, except the first bank. We have this additional seven, uh, tw uh, fifth, uh, sixteen banks up here, or sorry, 16 locations up here that are mapped to every bank. And those are seven zero hex to seven FX. Here they use an H afterwards for hex for some reason, instead of zero X, but. Uh, so we front. denote that zero X seven zero. Instead yes, of 70 right, X, 70. Right. Yeah, they, I don't know why they wrote it like this. This is, this is what they did. But in MP Lab X, this notation won't fly. You have to put 0x70. So they wrote 70h just because it's shorter and they could fit it in between here without having to make the letters smaller. And then, so we have, so 96 bytes here, 80 plus the 16, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80 48. And if you add that up, if we add that up, it's kind of interesting. So, so if we do, if we take uh, 80 times, let's see how many, 
what is that point? 80, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. So 12 times 80. Let's see here. 12 times 80. Oops. So 80 times 12 or 12 times 80 plus 48 for that last bank that only has 48 plus the 16 in the, uh, in, the, in the first bank that are mapped to every bank. And you do this, it works out to be 1,024 equals 1K. We have 1K of RAM in this chip. And then- Yeah, yeah. go ahead. Select a different um, address and bank two. Is do I do I need to do how do I like do I need to like bank select uh, and then have a specific reference or do I do this bank select and it's like one twenty x? Okay, let me so let's let's look at that then. Yeah, we'll do that. Good question. So what we would do? So so if you look, you see along every side here, you actually have the numbers. So here are the numbers and you can just write, so you can, you can, let's say you wanted to put the, the data here and location. Uh, uh, so bank 10, it would be 0x515, 515 hex. That would put it right here in bank 10, this location. And when you got ready to use it, let's say you call that, you call that, uh, you call that uh, variable, say, uh, um, say uh, Q. When you when you wanted to use Q, you would have to bank cell Q, and the bank bank cell the compiler would look at Q, would figure out okay where's Q stored? Okay, he did an EQU Q equals uh, five one five hex, so it's stored in five hundred and fifteen hex. So uh, so let's figure this out. So it would do the le the lower seven bits. It would embed in the instruction. Well, the lower seven bits, it would take it would the bank cell instruction would take the upper five bits and create an MOVLB instruction with those upper five bits. And in this case, the upper five bits would be 10 decimal or it would be uh, a hex. So zero X A. Remember, you only get five bits. So it'd be A. So the, the actual value placed in the bank select register would be zero one zero. One zero. That's what would go in the BSR, and in, then in the in the, the lower bits, the seven lower bits. When you wrote uh, uh, MOV LW to uh, Q, the lower seven bits would then be automatically figured out and placed in the lower seven bits of that instruction, and stored in program memory to be executed when you got around. You know when when the program counter got to that instruction. Does that make sense? That makes perfect sense. Thank you, sir. Yeah. So it's so again, um, we we probably won't write programs where we have this many variables where you're you know using them out to bank ten. In fact, I, I, we probably won't write a program. You probably well you might you might write a program, but when we write them in C, we don't have to worry about this. C takes care of all this for us. It it automatically sticks them in in these in these uh, appropriate locations wherever it wants to, and it uses indirect addressing. And one of the nice features about indirect addressing is you don't have to use the BSR anymore. You don't have to mess with that, uh, but you do have to mess with, with essentially 16-bit registers. Uh, and, and so um, it's a little confusing in assembly language. That's why we're not gonna do it. Although you're welcome to play with it if you want. But um, and if, you, if you want me to show you how to do it, I'll be happy to. Uh, you can certainly use indirect addressing in assembly. It's fine. Uh, if you had to get, if, if in assembly you had to have an array of, say, more than 96 bytes, say you wanted 100 bytes in a row, then you'd have to use indirect addressing or you'd have to figure out how to split the banks and that, that would be really tricky in a loop. So, so it's much easier just to use indirect addressing for something like that. Okay, I think, uh, so... Let me just review this because I want I want to beat this one into your head, and then on Thursday I'm going to talk about uh, I'm going to talk about two other things. Let's see. Let me let me share the screen again. Okay. So so the other things I want to talk about. So so I'm gonna I'm gonna have you do 
we're going to cover essentially four basic functions or five, maybe four or five basic functions of assembly language. So the first one is for loop. So I want you to be able to write a for loop in assembly like we just did. The next one we're going to do is we're going to exchange the contents of uh, say we have two variables, we'll, we'll say variable A and variable B. So let's say we wrote 25 into A and we wrote uh, three into B. After your program, you would have three in A and 25 in B. So we're gonna just switch them like this. So we're gonna write that program. And then I want to write a program where we're going to uh, branch when you push the push button. So we'll, we'll read the push button and we'll do a loop. And when you finally push the button, you'll jump out of that loop and go somewhere else. And then finally, I want to do uh, how to configure A, a, um, a special function register, like, like the OSCON. So it's exactly like we did OSCON, only we'll pick another one. It's also like we did, uh, we did the TRIS register, we did TRIS A and we did some others, the ANCEL and the LAT A. So we've, we've, we've done, a, we've configured a bunch of registers already, but we'll do a different one maybe like for timer one or timer zero or something else, but you have to configure registers. And the, the key to that is uh, like for OSCON. So for the OSCON register, one of the first things we have to do is we have to go to the oscillator control module and actually we, it's easier to get up from the bottom. So here's the OSCON. So we have to go and look at this register in our data sheet and see Okay, so it's got a bit seven is S-P-L-L-E-N. What is that? Ah, software phase lock loop enabled. Save software phase lock loop enabled bit. Now, if you read this and it says, if the phase lock loop enable in the configuration word is set to a one, then this doesn't do anything. So if you turn on the phase lock loop in your configuration words, then it's gonna be on for, for always. But if you don't turn it on, then you can turn it on and off in software by changing this bit. And then we have the four bit field, which is your clock frequency if you're using the internal clock uh, module. Internal oscillator frequency select bits. Now notice some of these have a little note, a little one there. These have a one and these have a one. And oh, notice this. If you ever wondered what frequency does the clock run at when it comes out of reset before you've configured this, this module? Ah, default upon reset. So you're always running at 500 kilohertz until you change your clock module. So when you actually run your program, your first few instructions run at 500 kilohertz until you configure the clock module. And what we, the value we put in there was this, which is 1101. And note this says, um, where was the note down here? Where is the note? The one. Uh, oh, note one. Duplicate frequencies derived from the high frequency internal oscillator, uh, which basically means uh, that the phase lock loop is being used. So, so if you have the phase lock loop turned on, you, you're the only. Um, oh, it doesn't actually say that. Yeah. Well. Yeah, you have to read elsewhere. Some of these values you can only pick if you've turned on the phase lock. Okay, here. Yeah, this is this is based on the phase lock loop. If the phase lock loop is on, this is at 32 megahertz. If it's off, it's at eight megahertz. And maybe that's the only one. Yeah, some of these are the, yeah some of these are the duplicate frequencies. So here are the phase for these. So you already have a 500 hertz here with this code. And you can get it here if your phase lock loop is on. And a couple of others are like that. So there's about four of them where you, you, your phase lock loop is on, 
here, off here, same, same frequency. Okay, uh, I think that's right. And then, so then for our case, we wanted to pick uh, four megahertz. So 1101, 11101. And then this bit is unimplemented. And the last two bits are described down here, 1x internal oscillator block. Okay, so, so we're gonna, so, so then if we switch to our, our paper here, so we have, the first one is a zero, we'll leave off our phase off loop. And then it was one, one, zero, one. And then it was an unimplemented bit. And then one don't care, we'll make that don't care zero. So now we divide it up into groups of four so we can write it in hex. So this is gonna be zero, one, one, zero. So that's gonna be six. And this is one, zero, one, zero. That's gonna be A. So this is zero X six alpha. And that is the value we wrote in our program to set our clock, sorry. You didn't see it. So it's zero one one zero. That's a six one zero one zero. That's alpha. So that's zero x six alpha. So that's our that's our that's our uh, constant value that we're using to set our processor at at four megahertz. And that's how you have to. That's how you configure the OSCON register. Now, in truth, we really should go back and read the whole thing should read this overview. We should read all the various modes. It can be, it can be operated in external clock low power, which goes up to 500 kilohertz, external clock uh, medium power up to four meg. And then you have to use external clock high power if you're gonna go to 32 meg. And then, then there's a low power crystal mode. Uh, there's, a, there's a medium gain crystal or ceramic resonator mode up to four meg. And there's a high gain crystal or ceramic resonator mode and then there's a simple RC circuit that you can use. And then there's your internal oscillator. And the internal oscillator can go from 31K to 32 meg. And then it gives a bunch of other things. And you basically have to read these things in detail multiple times to you really you know, understand. You really have to understand everything because there's often little gotcha clauses that you might miss if you're not, you know, if you haven't read it all and looked at it carefully, here's the module. And then, then they go through uh, clock source types. They describe how to do the external sources. And it turns out for a lot of these external sources, there's all sorts of, uh, like if you're gonna use, I've used resonators. I used to use a ceramic resonator all the time. You, this C2 and this C1, you have to have these two capacitors in there. And uh, if you don't, and the, and the capacitors, they tell you what they have to be. Um, they tell you what, give, depending on your frequency, you have to calculate that capacitor and you have to go look at these, uh, these, uh, these, these additional notes, AN 826 or 849 or 8943 or 949 on the microchip website. You can read those, uh, those, um, the, those, uh, uh, forget what AN stands for, uh, application note, those application notes, uh, and it'll tell you what frequencies you have to pick depending on what frequency used for the ceramic resonator. So I got ceramic resonators that were four megahertz. And then I picked the crystals, uh, I picked the capacitors uh, based on the, those application notes. And then uh, sometimes it wants you to put a series resistor in and they've got a note on that. Series resistor may be required for ceramic resonators with low drive level. Um, and, you know, depends. So that now you have to look at the data sheet for your ceramic resonator. <laughs> It can get kind of crazy. And, and then when you get all done, you darn well better test it at a whole bunch of different power drive levels and, uh, and temperature conditions to make sure it's really gonna work like you think it will. Otherwise you may be surprised. So these are the kinds of things you, you always have to take into account. Uh, and then you read the rest of this. Oh, there's an oscillator startup timer. Oh yeah, so when you power up the chip, the resonator is not instantly running correctly. It takes, it takes uh, actually maybe even a millisecond or two or three. And so you have this internal timer that lets it run on the internal clock for a while and then it, and then it gets up to speed and then finally it transfers control over. And, and there's a bit you can set in your configuration word about when you want it to do that. And then there's your phase lock loop and the whole bunch of stuff here it talks about Quartz crystal characteristics vary according to type, package, and manufacturer. Users should consult the manufacturer data sheets for specifications or recommended applications. 
Always verify oscillator performance over the VDD and temperature range that is expected for the application. VDD is the, the voltage you're running the chip at. So if you switch it from three volts to five volts, you may find a, a difference. And it turns out that uh, there are, that if you try and run at low voltage, the chip will run at 1.8 volts, but at 1.8 volts, it can never get the 32 megahertz. Its maximum speed is, I think, four megahertz or something like that. So there's all sorts of things. And that's why, uh, why you have to do a lot of reading to, to get this stuff right. Um, but, but, and that's why, you know, this is an introductory course. So you're not going to come out of here, uh, you know, hardened, uh, you know, industry hardened uh, professionals, but you're going to come out of here with sort of a head full of knowledge that allows you to be sensitive to the things you might have to think about. And, and one of those things is read the data sheet. <laughs> Otherwise, you'll get burned. All right. Any questions? We got a, about a minute left. So Thursday, I'll talk about the timer module that you're going to use on uh, Friday. And one of the things, let's look at, uh, I think, uh, where's a... So here's a nice pictorial. Notice here's your CPU. Here's your flash program memory. Here's your clock module. And then here are all your peripherals. You oh, got screen again. Go ahead. You're not the you're you're not sharing your screen. Oh, sorry. My bad. So here's a block diagram. And here's the CPU, clock module, program memory, random access memory, your little 256-byte EEPROM that you can put non-volatile data in if you want. And it'll still be there even when you cycle the power port A, B, and C, and then all the modules. Analog to digital converter, timer zero, timer one, timer two, four, and six, comparators, uh, the UART for communicating to your desktop and laptop, uh, your master synchronous serial ports for SBI or I squared C, you've got two of those, and your capture, compare, uh, and enhanced capture and compare, and PWM. So you've got four of those modules, your SR latch, and there's a whole bunch of modules they haven't even put on here. Uh, so, um, so there's other stuff. Uh, I forget. You can actually look down through here. Watchdog timer, um, your fixed voltage reference, your temp, your built-in temperature indicator that's <clears throat> built into the actual die, so you can see how hot your chip's getting. Your digital to analog converter. So you've got an A to D. But you've also got a D to A. Uh, your your uh, uh, your data signal mo modulator. Uh, and then uh, your capacity touch sensing, your, um, yeah. So I guess those are the ones that they left off. They left off a bunch here. They made this generic for different chips. So there's a lot of things your chip can do. Questions? Dr. Martin? Yes. On Thursday, are we gonna be going over um, homework two? Uh, I can, is it due on Thursday? Uh, no, but it's due on Tuesday, so I was hoping. Oh, I... next week, you mean? Yeah. Okay, I'll go. Yeah, if you remind me, I will go over homework two on Thursday. All right. Thank you so much. Okay. All right, guys. Uh, so we'll hopefully uh, we'll see you then on uh, Thursday, and hopefully this that'll be our last Zoom class. But we'll see. I don't know. I haven't heard anything. Oh. So we'll... okay. Go ahead. So next week we will be in person. That's the plan, unless uh, the university says they changed the plan, which they have not put out yet. So we'll see. Okay, thank you, doctor. All right, okay, bye-bye.